Okay, so let's talk about Stuart Hall's encoding decoding model of communication and how it relates to ideology and hegemony. While he doesn't really theorize to any great depth uh, the concept of ideology, Roland Barthes is nonetheless clear that myths contain ideological meanings. Now, these conceptions come from Roland Barthes' book, Mythologies, that you see there. And in that book, Roland Barthes argues that myth and ideology, in their structuralist senses, are synonymous. For Barthes, the ideology of, uh, say, for instance, French colonialism, as we'll see in the next slide, uh, um, is uh, perfectly an exemplar of what he wants to get across about uh, the power of myths and hidden meanings. So here you see a very, um, very uh, famous example that Barthes used in his book to illustrate the power of myths. And in this example, we see the proud salute of the black soldier. Uh, it's only by deconstructing a myth or reading a myth's hidden meanings that its ideology, the values and beliefs it upholds, can be uh, exposed. So here you see the, the black soldier who is at once a proud soldier and uh, at the same time a colonized subject as a black child. So there were uh, a number of uh, structuralist Marxists like you see here, um, Louis Althusser, who followed Barthes. Some others were Stuart Hall and, and, and others as well. Um, and the concept of ideology has been theorized to a great extent uh, by these structuralist theories. Now, Althusser in 1971 argued that individuals in capitalist societies are governed by what he called ideological state apparatuses. ISAs. Uh, and these apparatuses uh, include schools, the legal system, uh, religious institutions, media, communications organizations, and so on and so forth. These ISAs espouse the ideologies of powerful political institutions like the government and armies in implicit, uh, not explicit ways and sometimes without even knowing it. As such, the individuals internalize uh, ruling class, ruling capitalist ideologies, um, unaware that their lives are represented by the very institutions that, that uh, represent and, are, and actually serve them, and perhaps even employ them. As Hall notes, Althusser's approach was much more sophisticated than the classical Marxist notion of top-down false consciousness, which suggests that ideology is imposed from above by these uh, sort of elite powers uh, who impose their will upon the pliable, unknowing masses. And you'll see uh, much of that in Adorno's conceptions as well. ISAs point to a more linguistic approach. Uh, that they are uh, a more uh, discursive conception of ideology that is reproduced by various institutional practices and structures. Now, Ellis Cashmore, a media theorist, wrote a book all, that did just that. It applied Althusser's theory of ISAs to television by suggesting that viewers are given a partial view of the world that fits with state interests, even when television is not explicitly state-controlled. Now, although Althusser's ideas can be applied to the media, the ideas of Hall are um, somewhat different in the fact by the fact that they rework structuralist theories of ideology into a more systematic theory of media in their social and cultural functions. Paul criticized Althusser for assuming that ideology, although internalized, always functions 
to reproduce state capitalist values. He said, how does one account for subversive ideas or for ideological struggle? And as such, Hall defines ideology in a discursive sense as, uh, as he wrote, ideas, meanings, conceptions, theories, beliefs, etc., and the form of consciousness which are appropriate to them. Hall, along with other theories associated with the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, people like Dick Hedbidge and David Morley, uh, investigated the relationship between media and ideology. Uh, though semiotic analysis of systems of signification in texts such as television news bulletins was an important part of their uh, arsenal of analysis. Hall's aim here was to rediscover ideology as a concept that can reveal the politics of signification that in, um, uh, the politics of signification that's engaged in uh, by media institutions. His starting point here uh, was to attack behaviorist theories of the media. The models of effects are like Laswell's formula theorize that the communication process um, operates uh, due to its reliability. Now if you are not familiar with Laswell's concept, concept uh, we know that Laswell conceived of the communication process as basically a two-way uh, model. There's the producer and uh, the, the creator um, formulate a message with these sorts of embedded meanings and it goes straight to B, the audience, who consumes the message in exactly the same way. And so if messages are not received as intended, this is deemed to be a failure of communication in a technical or behavioral sense. Uh, according to the effects perspective, messages are not received correctly if the channels of communication from sender to recipient are distorted by electrical or human error. The meanings of messages themselves, however, are assumed to always be distortion-free and universally transferable. Now, Hall argued that behavioral models are flawed because they fail to situate media communications within existing social, economic, and political structures. The meanings of messages then are able to be distorted and interpreted differently than intended according to the positions of the producers um, and the audience. Uh, within you know these existing structures. What he said was meaning is a social production a practice. This world, the world has to be made to mean. Language and symbolization is the means by which meaning is produced. This approach dethroned uh, the referential notion of language which had sustained previous content analysis where the meaning of a particular term or sentence could be validated simply by looking at what in the real world it referenced. And so content analysis is a favored method of cultivation theory. And cultivation theory uh, in a nutshell is, is when the audience uh, assumes the direct message of the producer and in fact acts on it. So for instance if you have a person who looks at a lot of television crime shows uh, and who comes away with the idea that the world around them is particularly dangerous uh, and that they should always be aware that there's danger around the corner. So there are no mediating factors uh, that um, sort of uh, uh, temper that notion. The person basically consumes what they see on television. So what Hall said is that content analysis is re re rendered meaningless by the structuralist perspective on meaning as a social production. And like Saussure and Vartz, Hall states that meaning is a discursive process that operates within a language system, what he termed 
a set of codes. Uh, and all of these are loaded with ideological signification. Media institutions and the text they generate are important ideological dimensions through which we make sense of the world. Hall deploys semiotics to understand the sense-making process by which media transmit messages to their audiences. Language is encoded. It's made to mean something. Uh, it's encoded by those with the means of meaning, pro of meaning production, uh, the producers of the messages, and is then decoded, made to mean something by the audiences. Hall extends this um, a semiotic theory of media construction to a model of media production and reception, uh, which is commonly known as the encoding-decoding model of communication. And here you see it here. And so, unlike the behaviorist approach to communication, Hall's model of encoding-decoding does not assume a direct correspondence between the meaning intended by a sender and how that meaning is interpreted by a recipient. The codes of encoding and decoding may not be perfectly symmetrical. Um, th that um, uh, It may not be perfectly symmetrical by a recipient. What he said was the codes of encoding and decoding may not be perfectly symmetrical. And he's interested in how media represent and misrepresent what they rather rather than simply reflect those meanings onto their audiences. So while encoding and decoding are separate processes, they are not arbitrary. Encoding at the phase of production operates within a set of what he called professional codes such as technical competencies and high budget production values. You see the, the model there of the encoding decoding process. So going back to encoding, these professional codes that he illustrated generate preferred meanings that have the institutional political ideological order imprinted in them and have themselves become institutionalized. Television uh, is the medium that Hall studied the most and that he was most interested in, although one could extrapolate much of this to the, the audiovisual component of the internet. Uh, and so, you know, sort of as an example, we can look to, uh, in Britain, the, um, the BBC, which operates a professional code that's in line with their public service ethos. So one characteristic of this code relate, relates to uh, the BBC's political impartiality. Uh, the BBC is not allowed to take sides in party politics, otherwise it would be breaking its codes and being unprofessional. The preferred meaning that's encoded by BBC news channels therefore include political impartiality. The assumption is that audiences would not decode partial political points of view if, as you know, they adopt the BBC's preferred meanings in their news broadcasts. Now, while Hall argues that preferred meanings have considerable weight in determining how messages are decoded, they are not determinate. This means um, uh, this returns us to a very basic but crucial theory of structuralism that informs the decoding, the encoding decoding model. In a determinate moment, we'll just go to the next. So, in a determinate moment, um, it is um, uh, the structure uh, that's employed. Uh, uh, code and yield, the code yields a message. At another determinate moment, the message via its decodings issues into the structure of social practice. It is precisely because encoding and decoding are di distinct determinate moments that explain why the meaning structures of media production do not reflect reality in an objective sense. 
Rather, in the case of television, messages can only be signified within the audio-visual forms of television discourse. Say, a news event like a state funeral or an inaugural event, for example, cannot represent the experience of actually being in attendance to the funeral. It can only signify what the experience is really like through the meaning structures, the rules, and the convention of the televised message. Media, like language systems, are therefore structured through a set of rules, a set of codes and values that make them highly prone to ideological construction of meaning, or what Barth referred to as myths. Television is a primary myth maker, uh, constructor of ideology, according to Hall. Processes of editing, uh, selecting, uh, camera operation, music arrangement, arrangement of the various uh, actors on the stage. These are all important aspects of encoding in the sense of determining preferred meanings. So uh, the BBC news bulletins, like those of all news institutions, are loaded with the ideology of professionalism. And you could sort of extrapolate this to uh, PBS as well, but uh, in, a, in a less uh, distinct way. What news stories are selected, how each of them are edited, and how they are arranged in a particular order of importance are just some of the ways in which the ideology of media professionalism is constructed. Ideologies of newsworthiness do not correspond to an objective set of cri criteria. On the other hand, con newsworthiness is highly subjective and it differs from institution to institution and from country to country. But nonetheless, wherever newsworthiness is practiced, on the BBC, on CNN, Al Jazeera, MSNBC, wherever, it exerts its preferred meaning upon its audience. So encoded ideology such as media professionalism and newsworthiness do not determine meaning structures at the reception phase. Now Hall identifies three categories of decoding through which audiences make meaning of media messages. So here you see them right here, the first, and in keeping with the professional code, uh, an audience member may adopt a dominant code which accepts the preferred meanings intended by the encoders who are, again are the media producers. A second possibility is that an audience member adopts a negotiated code which accepts some of the preferred meaning of the media production but then opposes others. So on a general level, the encoded meanings may be understood, they may be endorsed, but on a more specific level, uh, the local level, these meanings and the rules within which they operate may be discarded as audience members consider their own positions to be exceptions to the rule. So for example, if you have someone who has a child and they're looking for information about how to rear the child or deal with the child not sleeping and they look at a uh, television show that says to put the child on its back. Uh, well, they may have a different experience. Uh, they may agree that in general the best advice is to lay the baby on its back when placing her in a cot, but they may disagree in the case of their own baby who only ever sleeps um, uh, in a, another particular way. So third and finally, uh, an audience member may completely disagree with the preferred meanings of media producers, both on a general level and on a local level, uh, in which case they adopt an oppositional code and decode the message in a globally contrary way. For example, if you have a news story uh, that might be uh, encoded with uh, a preferred meaning about how um, you know kids uh, are becoming so troublesome, uh, youth are troublesome and antisocial uh, than previous generations of young people. Well, an oppositional code uh, that's adopted at the moment of decoding might uh, disagree completely uh, because the person who is listening, the audience member, has a historical knowledge of how young people have committed crimes and 
been stigmatized by societies, including the mass media, uh, since you know since long ago, and so they would reject that message that says all troubled youth are antisocial and worthy of locking up or something like that. So Hall is an attempt to rediscover and rescue ideology from the conception uh, of it as being omnipotent, uh, an oppressive force wielded by the ruling classes upon the masses in the classic Marxist tradition of political economy theory. But in a later work, Hall refers to what he called the problem of ideology as a concept. He asks, can it still withstand application in contemporary democratic societies where media institutions appear free from the power of states and commercial forces? The media appear to be beyond that. Then they can um, publish um, uh, articles and artifacts that are much, much more damaging to uh, these sorts of uh, institutions of domination. So Hall acknowledges that Marxist theories of ideology tend to overemphasize negative and distorted features of uh, capitalist ideas and values. Nevertheless, he remained sympathetic to Marx's original formulation of ideology, and particularly to the related concept of hegemony that was formulated by Antonio Gramsci. Unlike many Marxist conceptions of ideology, such as that of Ordorno, Marx did not suggest that ideology amounts to mass deception, but rather to a situation where individuals within capitalist societies can only gain a limited impression of the consequences of such systems, given ideological constraints imposed by ruling power elites. The best revision of Marx's ideas um, to Hall were those proposed by Antonio Gramsci, who contended that in particular historical situations, ideas organize human masses and create the terrain on which men move and acquire consciousness of their position, struggle, that kind of thing. Social, economic, and political ideas create struggle, and ideological struggle is part of the general social struggle for mastery and leadership, in short, for hegemony. So Gramsci's theory of hegemony marks a fundamental shift from orthodox structuralism to a more discursive form of post-structuralism with which Hall, among others, has identified. Hegemony, unlike orthodox approaches to myth and ideology, is about a dialogue between those parts of a society with and without the power to signify their values and intentions. So what he said, hegemony is understood as accomplished, not without the due process of legal and legitimate compulsion, but principally by means of winning consent of those classes and groups who were subordinated within it. This approach could also be used to demonstrate how media institutions could be articulated to the production and reproduction of the dominant ideologies, while at the same time being free of direct compulsion and independent of any direct attempt by the powerful to nobble them. So in other words, hegemony is a give and take form of power. Hegemony works to permit dissenting voices and oppositional politics, but to also suppress the force of dissent and opposition by actively seeking out support from all parts of a society. Media, I'll argue, encode their products in the interest of dominant hegemonic forces like the government. The professional code operates within the hegemony of the dominant code. So even if media institutions do not intend to collude with the forces of hegemony that operate in their countries or regions, 
they are likely to do so unwittingly because hegemony, unlike more orthodox versions of ideology, is a function of existing social structures and practice, not as intentional uh, uh, of the individuals. Um, the behavioral, uh, the behavioral theorists like Katz, Elio Katz, and uh, Carl Lazarsfeld, who argue that the media have no direct effects other than to reflect the consensus opinion among people. Graham Paul argued that media in their propensity to serve a hegemonic function for the good of those in power effectively manufacture consent. And we'll talk a little bit more the next time about Herman and Chomsky's um, uh, manufacturing consent and the propaganda model.